let's talk about our media. It does not take an expert to know that there's something very seriously wrong with our media. There's fake news, loudness, venom and anger, and often a complete unwillingness to challenge or question the government. There are many exceptions, of course, in the form of journalists who speak truth to power, often at a great cost to themselves. But as an ordinary Indian, you wouldn't be faulted if you said that the media ecosystem in the country, especially the TV media ecosystem, has been compromised. Now, this is an extremely dangerous impact on democracy and our lives. What happens when the media does not question the government enough on, say, COVID-19, which is a life and death issue? What happens when the media fans the flames of communalism and jingoism, even urging war? These are all questions we need to live with as Indians. But why is the media like this? We talked to journalist Anindya Chakravarti on the economics of the Indian media. Thank you, Anindya, for joining us. So uh, we've had a couple of interesting weeks uh, over the past, interesting weeks and interesting months as far as the media is concerned. Uh, yes. People, of course, in a time of crisis, looking to the media for answers, looking to the media for questions, in fact. But yeah. we do have, seem to have a media, especially a television media, but also in print which has not perhaps been as critical of the government as you would expect on multiple issues, although yeah. the volume has actually remained the same. So yeah. uh, to maybe strike a different note this week, could we talk a bit about what exactly makes the Indian media of today what they are right now, especially in relation to the government? So I think nowadays a lot of people use the term Godi media, which I think was uh, popularized by uh, my friend Ravish Kumar that uh, they're sitting on the godi, a uh, lap of the government or corporates. They're very scared. Right. Or, uh, I mean, uh, when you look at uh, being critical the, or being aggressive, the Indian news media is pretty critical and very aggressive when it comes to the opposition. The opposition says anything, they go hammer and tongs against. They're very critical of the minorities. They're very critical of uh, alternate politics, of alternate economics, and anyone who criticizes those in power Indian media is almost like a, you know, a watchdog against uh, democracy, <laughs> not for democracy. So uh, the question is, what makes Indian media what it is? And I would say there are broadly two things. One is, and they both stem for the same thing, which is the first is government and the second is ratings, right? They're scared of the government. And number two, they're scared of losing ratings. And this, this is where all readership, right? And this is where I'm, uh, uh, if I think more uh, e increasingly the television media has become more and more visible, more shared, videos are shared, small clips are shared. And uh, although uh, I would still believe that uh, the new influential news is still pushed by some newspapers and newspaper opinion is still more, uh, uh, you know, uh, still has more space amongst the uh, those with influence, those with power, newsmakers, but television makes a huge difference to mass opinion, to mass public discourse in general. And if one looks at it, one wonders why is this television media, which was so aggressive towards the end of UPA, right, uh, appeared to be robust, attacking the UPA on every scam, Commonwealth, 2G, coal, uh, taking up the issue of... Um, uh, you know, pushing Anna Hazare, the anti-corruption movement. How did it overnight become a complete, uh, you know, extension of the government's PR machinery? And I would say, as I said, two things. And it all stems from one thing, lack of money, lack of revenue. Now, uh, if I take a, a regular news channel, Prashant, a basic small Hindi news channel, it costs at least about 80 to 100 crore rupees to run that channel. Out of that, 30 to 50 crore, depending on how much a channel is willing to spend, and this is annually, uh, has to be spent on distribution, which is just to be able to reach a household, to be able to be seen on their uh, TV set. Uh, among them, cable uh, networks have to be paid, uh, carriage fees. You have to pay Doordarshan. The government of India has something called Free Dish, which is very popular in rural India and small towns. And you have to pay a huge amount of money to renew a contract every year uh, to be put on uh, free dish. DTH operators ask for money. So if you look at it, between 30 to 50 crores. This is before you've shot a single frame of any news, right? Uh, then you have uh, salaries, you have production costs, you have 
establishment costs, you have studio. I mean, you know what the costs are right. because you yourself are part of a news organization like that. Uh, but here's the issue. Most news organizations uh, spend very little on news gathering. Out of, if, they, if they're spending 100 crore every year, I don't think they spend more than two to three crore on actual news production, actual news gathering itself. And you'd say that what is news gathering cost? Well, news gathering cost is sending reporters out to uh, remote places to collect information. And that involves travel, that involves paying for a hotel closest to that village or small town, paying DA. You know, these, these are expenses. One has to call it. If you have to send a reporter now to the US to cover US elections, it's a huge expense. Many channels avoid it, right? And uh, you want to send someone to Ladakh, it's a huge expense. You want to post someone in a small town for a long time, it's a huge expense. No one wants to carry it. So therefore, it is amazing that a, if we even look at it as a product, as a business, the product itself, right, which is news, Real expenditure or recurring expenditure, ex excluding salaries, is 2 to 3% of the total cost. So uh, now if we look at it as to how much is being paid by viewers, right? If I take a, a newspaper, uh, a Times of India or Nabharat Times or anything like that, anything or an Indian Express or Hindu, anywhere between 3 to 8 rupees you have to pay uh, per day per copy, right? That works out to between 90 to 200 and, uh, 220, 240 odd rupees per month per newspaper. But each newspaper costs to produce about 15, 16 rupees each copy. Eh? So on each newspaper, between 50 to 80 percent discount is being given by the producer of that newspaper. So obviously, they have to depend entirely for the revenues on advertisers because readers are not paying even 30-40% of the total cost of that newspaper. Uh, so compare that to uh, a news channel. Let's take something like an NDTV 24-7, which is a pay channel. I think uh, on an average per month, you have to pay three and a half rupees for it, right? And uh, three and a half rupees is virtually nothing. If I take another channel where I used to work, NDTV India, right? The Hindi channel. Uh, on Tata Sky, you'll have to pay about 1 rupee 18 paise per month for it. Right? So imagine that even if you go and have in a sweet shop a chole bhature and a lassi, you'll probably spend 100 bucks. But to get your news, you're not even willing to pay 1 rupee 18 paise, which is why people often take watch free channels right. and don't pay for a news channel, even 1 rupee 20 paise in a month. So this is the first part. Subscribers do not pay when they probably can pay. They don't pay because they don't, they're actually not, not privileging news. It's easy to say that, oh, these news channels are terrible and look what they're showing. But if you're not willing to pay even a hundred rupees for it, then what do you expect? Now let's come to the question of ratings, right? Uh, obviously, ratings is important. Why is it important? Because as I said, that 95 to 96% of a news channel's revenues actually come from ratings. And without that, they will not stay afloat. Now look at what the problem is with ratings. If you look at it across the world, both in newspaper readership and uh, in news channels, in newspaper readership, tabloid press has many times the circulation of readership than serious newspapers. So things which say UFO landed on this man's, uh, you know, garden, right, uh, is going to be read and 10, 20 times more than a hard news uh, story in a newspaper. That is across the world. This is not new. Uh, if we look at entertainment channels, let's just compare ratings of entertainment channels here, Prashant. Uh, uh, look at uh, Hindi entertainment. The number one channel last week was Star Utsav. And if I compare the number one Hindi news channel, which is Aaj Tak, which has a pan-India reach, and I'm just going to look at what is called impressions, which is one part of reach, uh, one part of uh, the ratings process. Star Utsav has four and a half times the impressions on, uh, in uh, BARC, which is the ratings calculating organization, than Aaj Tak, the number four and a half times. If I compare 
English news channels to English movies. English movies have more viewership than English entertainment channels. Republic TV, which is the number one English news channel. I mean, it depends, obviously, if you want to call it news. Uh, but <laughs> it's technically categorized as news. So Republic TV's impressions is one-fifth of that of star movies. One-fifth. So an English news channel gets one-fifth or 20% of the impressions that an uh, English entertain a movie channel gets. So what is the temptation? The temptation is going to be, how, how do I get ratings? The best way to get ratings is to essentially make it entertainment, to make it sensational, salacious, things that people will watch. And again, I don't blame viewers because you know what happens is that you come home, you worked hard, and someone tells you that farmers are dying you're going to feel bad. You're going to watch it for 30 seconds. And then you're going to switch to a channel which is saying, Sushant Singh Rajput was killed. Right? We want an answer. Pakistan needs to be bombed. Or we have shown China and two people are shouting at each other, abusing each other. That is entertaining. That is entertaining to a lot of people. It is part of the overall system of, you know, gossip and chat that you would have after dinner. So that is the temptation. That is the extension of, and that is why the media is where it is in terms of ratings. Uh, of course, then there comes to the question, why is it so pro-government? Because without doubt, governments have huge power. It depends on whether they can exercise it. If it's a powerful government like we have right now, uh, then it can very easily get uh, advertisers to stop advertising on a channel. It can stop your distribution. It can tell cable operators to switch off your channel every now and then. It can uh, uh, put on fake IT rates. It can put false cases on you. It can uh, threaten, uh, you know, advertisers start feeling that should we advertise on this channel which questions the government on server because we might get in trouble. So these are very easy ways to actually control, control the media by if the government wants to because our laws actually enable the government. The cable and satellite laws enable the government to do that. And uh, therefore, it is all, if there's a strong government, media channels, media networks are always going to be scared. Finally, there is, of course, the issue of who owns these networks. Given that networks are increasingly being owned by big business or entities which have other businesses as well, then you understand that their main aim is to make money. And to make money, they don't want to be on the wrong side. If, if you also, if you uh, uh, run a big news channel, but you also are a telecom and a petrochemical giant, you're going to think twice about, you know, taking on the government. If you are, uh, uh, you own several newspapers, but you also sell uh, cement, or you have a uh, power company, and media is only one part of your business, what are you going to use it for? Big business or business actually wants the media to be used as a lobbying agency. So they're not going to really uh, spend money on the news or journalism. So it, that, you know, it is not really a question of uh, uh, the government controlling media and media doing this. It is essentially a catch-22 situation where lack of money forces media companies to do it. And mm -hmm. then they sell out to big business. Right, absolutely. And would you differentiate particularly between, say, the media in India and those in other countries? Of course, we have uh, we have the Fox News uh, network, of yes. course, in the US. We've had the Murdoch Empire, which is, what do you call, specialized in some of the trends you were talking about. Yeah. But broadly, uh, are there any characteristics that would be India-specific, so to speak? Because it does also look like the sheer number of channels moving rightwards is quite unprecedented. I think it's uh, the difference essentially probably is in the checks and balances available. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Fox News, of course, tapped again. Uh, ultimately, it's an issue of ratings, you know, uh, across the world. If you do not get viewers, you're not going to follow a trend. So Fox News very clearly wanted to get into that Bible belt, a bit of redneck, the uh, the angst against the liberals and the Wall Street, you know, against gov big government. And it tapped into that. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the entire Fox News experiment was based on that. Of course, it's very clever now uh, how it, the entire thing is now 
blamed on the president of Fox News and Murdoch claims that, oh, he was uh, running, you know, he was, they couldn't control him. But uh, there's a new mythology being made because he's dead. But that was part of the process of tapping into a system. And uh, of course, there was a captive right-wing uh, viewership which Fox tapped into. CNN could not do that. And Fox also invented these uh, things by which you could. Uh, so therefore, I don't. I think Indian channels are essentially modeled on Fox. It is most Indian channels are model of Fox. Fox brought in the idea of chat. Of uh, so the U.S. has something called talk radio, which is extremely opinionated, often right wing, and a uh, lot of Fox anchors like Sean Hannity actually comes from the talk radio space. Uh, it, they got Rush, Rush Limbaugh in who was an advisor to, I think, Reagan, Nixon, various um, Republicans. And uh, um, so, the, it, it, you know, the entire system actually is modeled on Fox across the world. In Europe, on the other hand, especially in England, where there is a significant amount of public funded television, there is some kind of a central centrist position. I know the BBC did take a very... Uh, objectionable, I would say, stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Labour Party. And uh, when it push comes to shove, they do move to the right. But there is a bit of a, they stay right off center rather than being this extreme right. And that is because it is publicly funded and it does not have to really worry about ratings. The moment you have to worry about ratings, then uh, news cannot be news. It's, it's very simple because, you know, as... Uh, one says that you know more uh, I think I was reading somewhere pornographic websites has much more traffic than uh, any other website right put together so people watch it they don't admit they watch it right so I'm saying that this the question is often uh, important things uh, and news is one of the things that uh, important things don't have that many takers but it has to be funded and the public needs to fund it in some way or the other. Otherwise, it's not going to exist. And otherwise, you cannot expect media to be uh, in any way uh, working as a bulwark of even bourgeois democracy. By that, I mean even representing different interests within the frame of a capitalist system. Because if capitalists completely take it over, it is almost as if they are manning the system directly. So. That is, it's an extreme form where we exist right now. Of course, I don't believe that the media is ever democratic in that sense. After all, if you look at it, Noam Chomsky, I think, wrote Manufacturing of Consent uh, sometime in the 80s, right? Early 80s. So it's now, what, almost 40 years since then. So this is nothing new. And uh, finally, if you, uh, I would suggest that our uh, viewers go to a website called fair.org. I'm sure, Prashant, you're aware of it. Uh, Fairness in, uh, I think, uh, I've forgotten what I stands for. Fairness in something and reporting, I think. It is fair.org. It documents all the, the way in which consent was created by uh, the American media. It's worth going to and seeing. And it's an eye-opener of sorts. The right. way in which media across the way world has batted for the powerful across right. the years. But in India, in, in India, it's an extreme situation right now. Absolutely extreme. And only viewers can stop it from happening. Right. Thank you so much, Arindya, for talking to us. Thank you, Prashant. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back on Monday with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.